Less than two months ago, the strongest storm to strike land in recorded history slammed into the Philippines. Typhoon Haiyan hammered the islands with 200 mile per hour winds and a two story high storm surge. It killed more than 5,000 people and left millions homeless. On Wednesday night, Nova, the PBS science series, presents Killer Typhoon, examining the storm and its aftermath. Joining us are Dr. David Robinson, climatologist at Rutgers University in New Jersey, and Chris Sch Schmidt, senior producer for NOVA. Good morning to both of you. Hi. Good morning. Uh, David, let me start with you. Why was Haiyan such a severe storm? It was one of the largest typhoons ever recorded on Earth. It had all the perfect conditions, brewing up in very warm waters, unusually warm waters. Uh, it had the perfect breeding environment, and therefore it produced exceptionally strong winds and a major storm surge, something not always seen in the Philippines. They're more commonly get very heavy rain from these storms. Right. When you talk about preparedness, though, Chris, I mean, they had satellite mm -hmm. images 12 days in advance. But sure. do you still think they were underprepared for what happened? Well, I mean, the Philippine government actually evacuated close to a million, 800,000 people away from some of the most dangerous uh, areas. And they probably saved tens of thousands of lives by doing that. The problem is, is that the, the storm uh, made a, followed the, the predicted track, but it was very difficult to know exactly what the intensity of the storm would be. Right. And I don't think anybody was prepared for that sort of a rapid storm surge. These people are used to typhoons, to them it's a bad day, mm -hmm. but it's not a cause for uh, fearing you know, life and limb. And there were 11 million people, as we mentioned, were affected. I mean, did, did relief aid actually get to them? Well, within 12 hours, the UN had a, had a, a task force in at Tacloban, which was one of the worst hit cities. Uh, on the east coast of Leyte Island. And the other aid agencies, Oxfam, uh, Save the Children, other UN agencies and so forth, got, got in there pretty quickly. The, the US Navy, the British Navy got in there pretty quickly. Uh, and the aid ramped up over a couple of weeks. And I think two or three million people right now have received aid of some sort. And you know, it's an ongoing effort, obviously. Dr. Robinson, when you look at the large scale of this, though, people are, climate scientists are saying the world is continuing to heat up. This could mean the oceans are warmer, which just <clears throat> means the Philippines could be bracing for more storms like this. Yeah, these storms feed off warm ocean waters, and it's a perfect <clears throat> percolation area for them to, to bubble up. Um, and with the oceans getting somewhat warmer and the atmosphere getting warmer, there's the possibility we may have more amped up, stronger storms. Not necessarily more, but the stronger storms just that much stronger. So you can say climate change contributed to this, but didn't necessarily cause it. Exactly. The proximate causes are what we've seen naturally for eons. Um, but with the w sea levels a little bit higher than it was, which yeah. added to the storm surge, the waters were above normal, the atmosphere is warmer than normal. It provides just a little better breeding ground for these storms. Chris, as we were talking, we saw some of the efforts of rebuilding in Tacloban. Mm -hmm. How are they doing right now? I mean, how do you really clean up after something so devastating? Well, I mean, if your houses are built essentially out of plant fiber or something like that, you're going to get not it's they're going to get knocked down every time there's a big storm. And so the Philippine government, from what I understand, really understands that they need to invest in more resilient infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So they need to help people build things that are going to be able to withstand these next storms. Because there's a cycle, uh, especially in the poorest regions, where something gets knocked down, they're, they, they're set back to zero, they rebuild it, it gets knocked down again. Um, and you know, there's some innovative stuff going on. Some cash is going into those places, and they're actually paying residents to clean up and salvage building materials. But you know, rebuilding in this case is sort of a relative term because right. you're going from zero to you know slightly above zero, and it's not a long-term solution. All right. Well, the program looks really interesting. David Robinson, Chris Schmidt, thank you both for being here this morning.